Hello and welcome to the LMI webinar series. My name is Aaron Spooler and today I have David Kepnes with me and he will go into how to singulate crowded scans using part detection. Um, essentially what that is, is uh, he'll be going over the part detection uh, configuration panel of the scan page in the GoCater interface. Uh, he's going to demonstrate how to prepare your scan for part detection, adjust your part detection settings, and also finally overcome the problem of crowded objects in your scan. So if you have a bunch of stuff and you don't know how to singulate those, um, he's going to show you how to do all of that. Now, before I hand it over to David, uh, I just want to point out the chat on the right hand side. Uh, so if you have any questions during uh, today's webinar, please use the chat on the right hand side. Uh, we'll get to our, all those questions as long as we have time. We'll do our best to answer them all. And uh, one final note is that today is being recorded. So if you have to leave for any reason, just uh, check your email box at the end of uh, in a couple of hours and you will see this recording there. Now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, hand it over to David. Good morning. Yeah, uh, good, we say good morning, but you're on the West Coast. Good afternoon or good oh, yeah. evening for everybody out uh, uh, in the in North America, here on the East Coast and over in Europe. My name is David Kepnes. Thanks for the introduction, Aaron. I appreciate it. Uh, so be, before we dive in, uh, I think it might make sense to just take two seconds to explain why we are having a webinar on part detection. So uh, when we speak of part detection with regards to the LMI GoCater, we're talking about uh, this panel here on the graphical user interface, bottom right hand corner. So it's a fly up menu. This is the one. And this uh, setting of these parameters allows you to sort of singulate parts in a, in a very busy scan and get individual parts up onto the screen for subsequent measurement. So what's kind of unique about part detection is it is, it's a pre-processing step. Uh, if you can contrast this with a variety of other tools uh, that are included with the GoCater, something like part matching or uh, blob detection or surface segmentation tools, these are all post-processing. So once you've already captured the image, you can then manipulate the image to identify the individual individual parts within it. This, uh, contrast to this, uh, the part detection does it during the scan and it produces only just the images of interest. So it gives you a little bit of perspective on how this tool differentiates from the others. There's certainly many ways to accomplish things using the GoCater, but uh, this is the unique part of that. So uh, today uh, we are going to use as our target uh, candy buttons. So I know these are popular here in the United States. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, each strip of paper has 48 little candy dots on them. And so this is a nice, a nice part to work with. I'm going to show you uh, what it looks like, I'll do a fixed length scan here. And by the way, I should mention this is a, this is going to be a live demonstration, meaning uh, we're not going to replay images through our emulator, but it's, if, if you see that I, I take a few seconds and my voice, I stop speaking, it's simply because um, uh, I'm going to be scanning live. So hopefully here I, I've got, I'm showing you what we're after. I've got the uh, candy buttons taped down to my bench top and I've got a go-cater mounted to a rolling gantry. So let me pop my webcam back and I'll step aside and I'll take a scan and I'll show you what we're working with today. Okay, so uh, this is a full uh, a full length scan almost actually uh, started a little bit too late, but um, this is what we're looking at here. So we have individual candy buttons on the paper and then the uh, blue green area on the exterior is just uh, just the desktop. So, you know, if you're a candy manufacturer, you're probably not interested in inspecting the paper. That's pretty consistent. But, you know, maybe you want to check to make sure that there are, in fact, 48 dots of candy on each paper or that there's no little drips um, or that there's no malformed pieces of candy. So anyway, this just gives you an idea of what we're after. So 
everything now subsequent to this, I'm going to show you uh, how we can individually uh, gather information about each one of these uh, parts or pieces of candy. So to do that, uh, while you're in scan mode, you, uh, you go from fixed length, we'll go back to continuous, and that will then activate um, the part detection panel. Before it was grayed out, and now it's not. So first thing to look at, at the very top. So these eight parameters here are very powerful, and I'm going to explain all of them in the webinar um, in two different sections. But the first thing that we're looking at is the frame of reference. So if the little thumbnails don't really give it away, there are two different frames of reference that are offered. The first one is a sensor frame of reference. <clears throat> and what that does is it keeps the global X and Y position of the part that's being scanned. Um, and why that might be helpful is if you would like to know the lateral position of the part, uh, maybe in a subsequent step, you're going to direct a robot to come and pick up this part, and maybe it's moving down a conveyor or something like that. Uh, you want to know where that part is sitting um, laterally. Is it uh, a couple of millimeters from the left, what have you? All that is retained in the scan. Um, whereas when you're using part frame of reference, uh, the GoCater reassigns the origin relative to the part. So once again, sensor frame of reference, the origin is that of the sensor. Uh, and you can see like there's a little scan part here, which is offset from the origin. And, and part frame of reference reassigns the origin to the center of the part. So I'm going to operate today here in part frame of reference. So ultimately, when all the parts show up on the screen, they'll all be centered in the middle of the screen. Okay, so that's frame of reference. The next thing is the height threshold. Uh, height threshold, think of it is at what elevation do you want to instruct the sensor to begin detecting a part? Now, um, in this case, and I'm going to just switch to uh, the emulator here, I already have a scan of the, uh, of, of the candy on the paper. Um, we are interested in just the candy. So wherever I hover over uh, the screen, I get the instantaneous elevation. That's the Z. And it, the paper in general is about a half a millimeter above the tabletop. But I see that it's kind of curled up. And so in some areas, it's, it's almost a millimeter high. So if the goal here is to detect just the candy and not the paper that's backing it, we need to assign a height threshold uh, which will ignore the paper. So let's just say one and a half millimeters. So every time I enter a, uh, a parameter, I hit the enter button and I know that it's, that it's taken. Uh, and I am going to do some interim scans here to show you the progress. But before I do, uh, we'll go to this next parameter, which is the threshold direction. And that's, this is simply uh, telling the software, telling the GUI, uh, are you going to detect above or below the, th the height threshold that you just set? So in this case, of course, we're interested in the candy that is above one and a half millimeters. So we're saying, please detect on anything that is above one and a half millimeters. So um, I'll show you, uh, I'll take a scan right now, step aside here and I'll take some scans. You'll see what we're working with. Okay, uh, I can, you probably saw them come up on the screen. My back was turned. I'll, we can replay it. You can see that it's actually doing the job. What we've set so far, it is capturing just the objects for the most part. This is a little bit of paper here. It is capturing the objects um, uh, that are one and a half millimeters above. But you can see there's still some work we need to do because it's not perfect. We're getting sometimes two, sometimes three parts, and we want to singulate these. This is uh, what the webinar is all about. One part per frame. So that'll take us to the next step. Um, it may seem like I'm jumping ahead, but after you set your height threshold and threshold detection, I want to go to this last one, and that's the maximum part length. And um, for this, we'll go back to um, 
my saved images. I have a, a couple of tools set up which might help here. We have a bounding box and I have it set to length. And um, this one is, so it's about seven and a half millimeters. Just moving around, that's almost eight millimeters, a little over eight millimeters. So uh, what's important to know is you want to tell it the maximum part length. So what is the maximum conceivable length of one of these little candy dots? I know what the average is, it's about eight millimeters, but you wanna make sure that you don't exclude any of the larger ones. And, and sometimes they get printed and they're a little bit more oblong in shape. So let's go back and let's choose 12 millimeters. So 12 millimeters should be um, should be inclusive. Uh, it should uh, not eliminate any of the buttons. What's I think what is important to know about your uh, maximum part length is that if you set it too short, then um, it will just scan a portion of the part and then it will include the rest the balance of that part in the next frame so obviously you want to set this to the right number such that uh, the entire part gets included um, and so that's what we've done here so um, uh, with that um, I know that it's not going to change much in the part count I think we had 38 parts show up so let's go to the next parameter which is the minimum part area uh, so for this particular uh, example of using the candy buttons, we can go back here. We have uh, an area tool, makes it really easy to get an idea of what the average areas are. They're about 50 millimeters, thereabouts. So um, sometimes there's little drips of candy on, on these papers, and maybe those little drips want to be, you want to ignore them. You want to instruct the software to ignore them and to only focus on just the full button. So I think that uh, maybe if the average here is about 50 millimeters squared, and um, this is currently set to five, why don't we choose 30? If we choose 30 millimeters, we know we're gonna get most of the big buttons, and if there's any little drips, they'll probably be ignored because they're maybe only just a few square millimeters. So with these configurations, let's take another scan. Okay, we have 39. That's probably an ugly one to stop on, but let's see what what's what's going on here. Okay, this is excellent. We're still, but we're still getting some doubles, and it doesn't look like we're getting any triples. And in this case, we're getting, we're certainly getting, um, you know, a lot more uh, paper. This is maybe the edge, so um, we can do something to ignore that later. I'll show you how that works. So we're getting there. Uh, I happen to know that there are 48 buttons on this strip, so our target is to just have 48 frames show up. So let's continue on this journey. Um, the, the next parameters worth addressing are gap width and gap length. And this just goes to the separation of the parts. How much distance in both the width and the length dimensions are there in between individual parts. So again, just because we've prepared for this in advance, I go back to my save image. I can use a surface dimension tool and I'm just finding the distance between edges here. So this one is under five millimeters. This one is over five millimeters, but because I already know that this one is below five and I go back here and I see that my gap width is set to five, that would explain why I was seeing multiple parts in uh, in the same frame. So let's change this to three millimeters. I think that's a safe bet. And let's go back to live scanning. And we'll take one more scan. And let's see how this turns out. And we have 48. So if you look here at the frame count at the top of the screen, we are at 48, which is the exact number that uh, it, we know is on the candy buttons. And we can review these, just get an idea of how it turned out. Yeah, we're in good shape. So this is, this is again, part frame of reference. I can, just to show you now that we have everything dialed in, I can show you what sensor frame of reference looks like. 
quick live scan. Okay. And now you can see that the origin remains that of the part. So it's, um, it's Y position, um, that row was captured basically simultaneously. And uh, now we could then uh, uh, do some subsequent direction for a robot or what have you. If you wanted to know if there was a bad part on your conveyor and you had some kind of uh, something to blow it off the conveyor, you can assign it, you know, know exactly where it is. So uh, this is um, the first part of the webinar, but you'll remember that the, the, the title of this webinar is how to deal with uh, parts that are crowded. And I, I wouldn't, I'll be the first to admit that these uh, candies on the candy strip that I was holding up, they're not exactly crowded. I mean, honestly, they're perfectly spaced. There are 16 rows um, and uh, three columns per row, and they're all generally uh, nicely arranged. That's one of the reasons why we selected it. But let's just say now that we are dealing with um, a more crowded target. So let me show you this. Let's go back to fixed length scan. And I'm going to move my sensor to another strip that I have set up. Let's scan that. OK. And although it clipped a little bit, I think you get the point. What I did was I broke some of the candies off uh, from another strip. And I just placed them down next to some of uh, some of them that were already prearranged. I'm literally just trying to crowd the end of the paper here. And um, I know that I have uh, 21 uh, candies here and something like uh, 17 here. So, um, or 31 and, uh, and 17. But I think that the total that we're after is something like 58 or 59, I wrote it down. So anyway, we're trying to introduce uh, a crowded situation. So now let's go back to continuous mode and let's just see what happens here if we use the parameters that we set up for the previous example with this particular uh, candy strip. So let's just do some scanning. Okay. And we end up with 44. So it's it should have 57. We already know that down here. Okay, so now we're getting like uh, almost five parts, but it's definitely very crowded here. So the parameters that we were working with before are not really relevant to this one. Uh, it's too crowded. So how do we uncrowd it and get individual parts on the screen? So uh, for sure, um, because I was just placing uh, individual candies next to each other, uh, let's see if the previous one, it, um, they are definitely much closer than they were before. Um, and and they tend, in some cases, they were actually touching. Parts were touching each other at the elevation of the paper. But we know that like the centers of each of these parts are very uh, separated from each other. So the base, which is sort of in green or blue, they're close, but the tips of them, the red areas, the white areas, the orange areas, those are further. So one thing that we can do to try to separate these out is to change the height threshold. Let's start looking higher up. So let's go two and a half millimeters. And now let's take another scan. Okay, 37. So, but it, now, um, each individual part is definitely smaller. We're, we're, we're clipping it higher up in elevation. So not a huge difference. We're after 57 parts, not, uh, uh, not uh, 37. So let's go to part length. Uh, since I'm now seeing less of each part um, and I've clipped them higher up, the length is definitely changed. So let's try eight millimeters. And also, I know that because I'm clipping them, I'm seeing less surface area. So let's change that to something like uh, 10 millimeters squared. 
All right, let's test these out. Fifty-one. Okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. Let's take a look at what we have here. Uh, do some replay. Going through. Let's go closer to the beginning. But we're still getting some doubles. Things are still getting clipped. Um, you know, we're we're definitely seeing you know very tiny partials. Um, and these are things that we definitely want to correct. So let's continue on the journey again. Um, you, you got it. We're definitely going to be now looking after the gap width and gap length. They're closer to each other. So let's say we want um, this to be one millimeter separation. Hit enter. We'll go back to scanning. Let's take another live scan. Fifty-seven parts. So that's the desired number, and uh, so we've sort of achieved our goal. We have managed to detect 57 of 57 parts, which is good. Uh, let's just take a, a quick peek, make sure we have no garbage in there. Yep, yep. So it may the uh, the GoCater does resize the image um, when it presents it on the screen, but for sure this is a much smaller surface area. It's a much shorter length than what we were dealing with in the, the previous example. As a matter of fact, I can throw a tool on it. Let's just do a simple bounding box. And I can tell you that the length here is, uh, you know, before we were looking at about eight millimeters, this is about uh, six and a half millimeters. Give you an idea of how small they are. So I guess the last thing that I want to show you, because we didn't, I didn't touch on it, uh, I didn't touch on it until now, but now it's it's certainly worth it. Um, if we go back to live and we look at the scan, I haven't talked about this padding width and padding length. Currently, the default uh, parameter is set to zero millimeters. What is padding? Um, padding is it is a parameter which allows you to add back some of the length and width. Uh, it exposes more of the part in both the length and width dimension. So it'll increase the surface area. So if you recall, because this is a, the candy parts are um, almost hemispherical in shape like this, uh, 3D. Okay, you can see that they're, they're hemispherical in shape. As you clip them higher and higher, um, you're getting rid of surface area. So if we use padding uh, width and padding length, let's just say half a millimeter, we can restore some of the surface area, some of the dimension that we had previously clipped away by virtue of setting a higher height threshold. So let me do a final scan here. I don't think it's going to have any impact on the number that we measure. Uh, actually, it did only because I was a little bit uh, jerky with the um, uh, moving the gantry, but um, we already know we can get 57 parts if I didn't scan uh, the first row and a half twice. But anyway, it now each of the parts are have had more of their surface area, more of their length and width restored, even to the point of this one, you're starting to even see some of the sides. And if memory serves, if we kind of keep clicking through, we'll probably even see, yeah, like so something like this. We're even seeing down to the paper. So that's what uh, padding width and padding length does. It That can actually be helpful um, if you did, in fact, want to see a little bit of the paper that was surrounding each candy button, but still needed to find a way to segment each of the individual parts. So with that, um, uh, I think we've covered all the parameters of the part detection tool. It is, it is a, uh, a part of the GoCater software that uh, uh, that we use every single day. It's really where you start. And um, hopefully that this webinar, you guys can recall on it uh, in the future. If you have any questions at this point in time, we'd be glad to take them. Thank you so much.
David, that was a great walkthrough. Uh, I don't see any questions coming up yet in the chat. I saw a few people raise their hands to speak, uh, but uh, that requires a whole other access thing. So if you do have any questions and you're watching this, please use the chat and we'll be more than happy to answer those questions. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick review of, uh, of what David did. There's a lot of steps, a lot of details. So I'll just kind of do my best to summarize all those things that David just did. Uh, and really, I'll, I'll fly by this pretty quickly. Um, this will probably be the most useful if you're watching this in a video at home. I'm just going to do my best to summarize that. So it was David was uh, demonstrating live, and he did an amazing job of it, was the candy buttons on a strip of paper. And the four major steps that he did was he acquired a first thing he did was a good surface scan using fixed length, just get an image of what's going on. Then he turned on part detection and adjusted his settings. Then he recorded a scan. And the ultimate goal is to get the number of recorded frames equal to the number of expected items. So if he's got 57 candy buttons, he should have 57 frames. And really, so this is the before and the after picture. Uh, he wanted to acquire a clean scan, singulate the scanned items into discrete parts. So he had all those crowded uh, pieces of candy. And uh, you saw at the end when he had those individual buttons. And let's see, I'll just go through the settings that he reviewed very, very quickly. So first thing he did was made a fixed length scan. So he just a couple of details. Uh, he used a profile sensor, one of our G2000 series sensors. Uh, so part detection is only available when surface generation is set to fixed length or continuous. So if you're using a profile sensor, using continuous automatically locks part detection on. This is something if you haven't used it before, just be aware of. It uh, throws a few people off. It automatically turns your part detection on. So the goal is already looking for an individual part. Whereas if you used a fixed length scan, it allows you the option to uh, turn part detection on or off. So that would be if you're looking at, uh, say, this part right here uh, with fixed length, you are you can turn it on, you can turn it off, but conti uh, continuous will automatically log that on there. If you're using a snapshot sensor or one of our G3000 series, uh, use time as a trigger, and that'll allow you to turn part detection on or off. These are just little details. If it's first time using it, uh, just a little quick walkthrough. So you notice he walked through the frame of reference. Uh, this allows you to choose your frame of reference either from the sensor or the part. Uh, using sensor as a frame of reference maintains the global x and y coordinates relative to the sensor's origin, whereas if you choose part as a frame of reference, that reassigns the scan's origin to be that of the part itself. And that's where uh, when he showed those individual buttons and they're on the center x and center y axes, he was using part. That's a good example of what happened there. Uh, next, he set the, the height threshold. So you can either set it above or below. He used above. And here's where he just started skimming out that paper. And he had a height threshold uh, roughly about two and a half millimeters. And that's where now he's starting to detect about, I think it was much higher than 30 of the 57 parts detected there. And just a quick tip, if you're not sure what Z threshold or height to use, uh, just take your cursor, hover over uh, the lowest point that you want to capture, and that will be roughly your, uh, your Z point. Next, David, uh, he set his maximum part length. And he, this, uh, the image there, just uh, we put a bounding box to show the average part length. You can see we got maybe a, a nine millimeter, seven, uh, 7.8. Uh, we have a couple of different measurements. They're all about different size. So he would have set his maximum part length to about nine, eight or nine millimeters because this determines the maximum anticipated part or object to be scanned. We're programming the locator to say, you were looking for parts this big. Uh, and here's once he set that parameter, he upped, uh, upped the number of parts detected uh, it was much higher than 35 than we expected. Uh, then he set the minimum area. This parameter uh, serves to filter out small parts. So in this example, he didn't want any drips or drops or small pieces of candy. He was telling the go we'd only want you to find a part uh, 
parts bigger than this minimum area. So the average surface area of these candy buttons was about 30 millimeters squared. Uh, you can see a couple of, uh, couple of measurements there. And here's where he's getting very close to getting all 57 parts. And the final bit, or sorry, uh, the penultimate bit was the gap width and length. And this is where you're uh, setting the locator to determine how far apart things are. So that would be, uh, he set the gap width and the gap length. And uh, in the crowded example, we know the parts much closer than the three millimeters that originally he set it at. And the final bit was the padding width and length. So uh, in the crowded example, some of the buttons got clipped. Uh, and here's where the padding, uh, adjusting the padding allowed, uh, it was possible to restore some of the buttons crop beneath the two and a half millimeter height threshold. So that's just a very quick summary of all those settings that David walked through there. So you see there's still no questions. We must have done an amazing job. Uh, so David, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, do you have any closing remarks before we end off today? Uh, I'm not going to really add anything. I just would reiterate that uh, uh, this is really just one of the tools in your toolbox. And it's the one that you should probably start with if you have uh, if you're scanning uh, something that has numerous parts and they may be close together. So instead of scanning the whole thing and then doing post-processing, I would uh, in encourage you to use part detection. Um, it's very fast. It doesn't do, it doesn't really require a whole lot of processing by the, by the sensor, which uh, the, the other tools that are included often do. So um, just to put it in perspective of what is available and why we start with this, uh, part detection is very, very useful. Excellent. Thank you, David. And thank you for the demonstration. Thank you for your expertise today. That was, My that pleasure. was excellent. It's a nice, easy, simple walkthrough of something that uh, sometimes if it's your first time using a go it can be a little confounding. So thank you for that. Got it. Excellent. And everyone at home and tuning in, thank you very much for, uh, for tuning in. Again, keep an eye on your email box. The uh, recording should be hitting there in a couple hours. Thank you again from everyone at LMI.